All right, so chapter 35, I'm very excited to, uh, to tell you we're on the last chapter of this book, uh, is going to be about the interpretation of trauma, pulpal lesions, and periapical lesions. So just like we talked about before, you know, it's really important to know what normal looks like so that we can identify when something is not normal, right? Well, this chapter is going to be about some of those things that are not normal. It starts on page 426 in your book. Learning objectives for this chapter will be to define the key terms associated with the interpretation of trauma, resorption, pulpal and periapical lesions as viewed on dental images, describe and identify the appearance of crown, root, and jaw fractures as viewed on dental images, uh, describe and identify the appearance of a luxation and an avulsed tooth as viewed on a dental image be able to describe and identify the appearance of external and internal resorption as viewed on dental images, uh, describe and identify the appearance of pulpal sclerosis, pulp canal obliteration, and pulp stones as viewed on a dental image, discuss periapical radiolucencies, and describe the appearance of periapical granuloma, cyst, and abscess as viewed on a dental image, as well as explain what is necessary to establish a definitive diagnosis. There's a difference between a uh, differential diagnosis and a definitive diagnosis, right? Then discuss periapical radiopacities and describe and identify the appearance of condensing osteitis, sclerotic bone, and hypercementosis as viewed on a dental image. Of course, as always, why are we doing this? So we need to provide a brief overview of the common features of trauma and pulpal and periapical lesions when we look at our dental images. Those changes that are associated with trauma, resorption, pulpal and periapical lesions can all be viewed on our dental images and we need to be able to recognize them. So some of the trauma that we might see on dental images are fractures and injuries, as well as the displacement of teeth. Ugh, this image makes me cringe. My two front teeth, I actually knocked them out. I like broke both of them. So my two front teeth are fake and, uh, and, and this just makes me, makes my stomach hurt a little bit looking at this. But uh, trauma is an injury that is produced by an external force of some kind. It can affect the crowns as well as the roots of the teeth as well as alveolar bone, right? So both the tooth, I'm sorry, the crown, the root, of the teeth and also the bone that holds the teeth. Those can all be um, affected by trauma. Um, it results in injuries of the teeth of uh, and bone and injuries such as intrusion, extrusion, and avulsion. You guys are going to talk about these in medical emergencies as well, but uh, this is a good way to, to get exposed to it. So the word fracture just indicates something, the breaking of a part. Okay, it can be anything can become fractured. Uh, it can affect the crowns and the roots of the teeth or the bones of the maxilla or the mandible. They can all be fractured. Um, so there are crown fractures, root fractures, and jaw fractures. Whenever there is a fracture that is uh, suspected or is evident, depending on you know looking at it clinically, um, an image, a radiographic image examination of that injured area is necessary to be able to fully understand the the full scope. So while it might look like just the root was fractured, uh, then we take a, an image, a radiographic image, and we're able to see that no, the, uh, the uh, alveolar bone was also fractured as well. So um, th it's important that we see kind of beyond just what we can see initially. So crown fractures happens most often with anterior teeth. Happened with me. I know actually a couple of you I've I've seen have already uh, shown me that you have some some uh, fractures of your anterior teeth as well. We've talked about those. So um, it can involve the enamel, the dentin, and or the pulp. In my case, I was uh, in high school. I uh, played soccer, and I was. Um, uh, well, okay, so the whole story, I uh, got hit with uh, the ball on my hand, which is, you know, frowned upon. But anyway, it broke my nail off and my, my nail was bleeding. And um, so I had to sit on the side and while I was over there, I felt like I was going to uh, pass out. 
and like throw up, which is the beginning of a, a vagovasal reaction, which is something that makes you pass out. Um, I was also kind of dehydrated, the whole the whole thing. But anyway, basically your system resets. I'm sure you've heard about this in medical emergencies. It happened to me. Um, and uh, so I was on the side in the stands and I passed out and I hit my face right on the, the uh, thing. I got a scar on my chin. I um, and I, I broke one tooth off completely and I just chipped the other one, but both of them were down to the pulp. So then I had to um, I had to go get root canals on my two front teeth and I had to get two crowns. I actually had them for 14 years and then uh, one of them broke because I uh, I didn't know at the time, but I was like the way I was biting into things was constantly putting pressure on one of them. So it broke right in half. And so 14 years after I had it replaced or had it put in, I had to go and get it replaced. And I'm so thankful that I did because the second version of these two, uh, they look so much better than the first two. I thank goodness for my dentist who was amazing. Um, I worked for him forever. So uh, of course I love him. And then I also have to thank the, the the lab for making them. But anyway, back to what we're talking about. The dental image permits the evaluation of the proximity of the damage to the pulp chamber and the evaluation of the root for any additional fractures. So when this happened to me, I had to get radiographs taken to see just how deep the fracture went. So on the one tooth, it was pretty obvious, you know, my pulp chamber was exposed. But then on the other one, it turns out that it had just fractured enough that it was close enough to the nerve that I had to have the root canal. Uh, but if it had been, you know, maybe a couple of millimeters less, then I might not have needed that second root canal. And so uh, it's it's important to, to take a, a radiograph so you know just how close to the pulp chamber that fracture really is. Uh, most crown fractures result from an accident involving a fall or a motor vehicle. This is something I love about being a hygienist is because whenever I see someone has a, a big filling or a crown on one of their front teeth, I always say, oh, what happened? And uh, and I love hearing all of the different stories that people tell me. Um, I had one woman who uh, she hated that story, and she but she told me anyway, and she said that she was, uh, you know, that like dance where you like step over a baby gate and you try to try to like hop over it, but she's short. If, if you're short, you understand. Um, and she's trying to get over it and her foot, she almost cleared it, but that back foot caught on it and she went face first into a counter. And, uh, and so I, I don't know, I love those kinds of stories. Crown fractures are the most common and they typically happen on, on anterior teeth. This is what it looks like. The crown fractures, uh, sometimes it can be just the dentin and sometimes it can go all the way down to the pulp. All right, so root fractures are less common than crown fractures, right? But they do still occur. Uh, they usually will happen in the maxillary central region. Um, they can be vertical or horizontal right? Uh, doesn't doesn't um, matter which one. And then also it can be single or multiple. There can be more than one fracture on the same tooth, right? And so um, it, it usually happens with an accident, either they fall or a traumatic blow or, uh, you know, if they bite into something too, sometimes that you'll get a, you'll get a root fracture. Usually with a, if you bite into like an almond or they chew ice or something like that, you'll get a vertical fracture. But anyway, um, if you, when, when you're taking the radiograph, if you get the x-ray beam perfectly parallel to the plane of the fracture, it will appear as a radiolucent line. The way that you see figure 35-4, you can see that perfect line of that fracture. Um, but if you don't get the x-ray beam perfectly parallel, then you might not even be able to see the fracture at all. Uh, if that's the case, the patient is in pain, Typically, you'll refer that patient over to get a 3D scan or a CBCT, a cone beam computed tomography sort of scan, um, to, to you know further diagnose that area. Uh, because if you can't see it, um, it does, doesn't mean it's not there, right? Um, keep that in mind. Sometimes you'll 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 get into a habit where you know the patient says one thing, but you don't always believe them. Um, and, and I mean, it, it happens. Sometimes they aren't sure. Sometimes, they, you know, they're not, they don't know. Um, I've had patients say they, they still have their wisdom teeth. And I look in there and there's, there's no wisdom teeth in there. So I'm sorry, but at some point you got those things taken out. But um, anyway, um, just because they say it hurts, 
if they say it hurts, it, it probably hurts. They're not going to come in and pay money and, and try to get you to do something to them unless it really is occurring, okay? Um, something else you need to keep in mind is that if the, the root fracture isn't treated early, if you don't find it, and so the patient kind of just deals with it, um, over time it will actually grow because it will, it will enlarge. It's not going to grow, but it's going to get bigger because um, if you look at that image 35-3, that root fracture, um, there's tissue in there. There's, there's space, and so uh, it will uh, get bigger because of bleeding and because of edema, edema meaning swelling, right? The swelling will actually cause that fracture to uh, to become bigger because obviously there, they, there's more pressure. This is that image I was just saying. Uh, if this area isn't treated, then they will that it will be bleeding in here and it will slowly over time because of swelling it will grow it will start to resorb the the bone around this area as well um, and so it's important that you get your patient treated as soon as possible so um, jaw fractures are most often they're seen in the mandible um, mostly because of the the way that the, the mandible kind of sticks out. And so uh, if a patient is hit uh, in the face, they, they more than likely break their, their lower jaw rather than their, their maxilla. Um, on a dental image, the fracture will appear as a radiolucent line, as all fractures will. And uh, maxillary fractures are, if, if they do fracture, which isn't as common, but I mean, they can, uh, if it does, become fractured, they're a lot harder to tell on a dental image. Uh, that's one of the ones that's gonna, we're going to have a really difficult time seeing on the radiograph. Um, and so most of the time for a jaw fracture, it results from like an accident, um, an assault. So people who get into fights and hit each other in the jaw and then uh, sports injuries. This occurs as well. Sometimes um, like motor vehicle accidents, things like that. People, people will break their jaw. Um, and that so maxillary fractures occur less frequently. That's the thing I want you to take from this. And that most of the time they involve the anterior alveolar bone and teeth. Uh, if the maxillary fractures happen, it would be pretty difficult because the the cheekbone, the zygomatic bone actually covers up the posterior portion of the maxilla. Um, it's not too often that a patient would break the, the back part. And this is just a, an example of that, that the tooth is intact, but the alveolar process around the tooth is broken. So injuries is the next portion. Uh, and this trauma can result in the displacement of teeth. The displacement, displacement will involve luxation. Luxation just means that the tooth isn't positioned the way that it should be. And so we have both intrusion and extrusion, we'll talk about those, and avulsion. Uh, dental images will allow for the evaluation of those structures after that tooth displacement in order to make sure, you know, if the, the tooth is uh, somehow luxated or evolved, then we need to evaluate the bone, right? We can't just stick it back in there. We have to, we have to look at it and make sure before we, you know, do a splint or we try to save it. So luxation is defined as the abnormal displacement of teeth, luxation. Uh, intrusion is the abnormal displacement of teeth into the bone, so the tooth will be pushed in, right? Extrusion is the abnormal displacement of teeth out of bone. So while not completely out of the bone, like not completely, you know, the whole tooth is is pulled out, but it will be sticking out. Sometimes it happens where um, the teeth get pushed forward. Um, and so they're kind of, uh, instead of being in their normal position, they're kind of, um, they're sticking out forward. So like if this is the normal position of teeth, then all of a sudden the bone is sticking, or the tooth is sticking out way out. Like if this is the nose, and then these are, you know, here's the lips, then <laughs> that's, uh, that's that. Uh, teeth have been that have been luxated should be evaluated with a periapical image, by the way, um, and they should be examined for that root and adjacent alveolar bone fractures just in case because you don't necessarily want to put the tooth back in there if it's been fractured or if the bone has been fractured. Um, and then any damage to the periodontal ligament and to the pulpal, uh, the pulp chamber need to be evaluated before you try to splint it and let it heal.
All right, so then this one is luxation. This was the example of intrusion, right? The tooth gets hit and it gets kind of shoved back up in there. Um, this is on figure 35-7. And then this one is, um, it says partial avulsion. Why, why did it, why did all of that go for extrusion? And then your book is like, no, partial avulsion. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, this is extrusion where the, the tooth is sticking out of bone. It's, you know, it's supposed to be further in, but it's sticking out. So that's extrusion, um, or you can call it partial avulsion because avulsion means the tooth is completely removed. Uh, this is figure 35-8 on page 428. So dental evulsion is the complete displacement of a tooth from the alveolar bone. It's basically the tooth got pulled out, but not at the dentist's office in the way that we want it to, right? Uh, because of trauma. So a periapical image should show a tooth socket without a tooth. The, it, it usually will result from trauma, uh, like an assault or an accidental fall. Um, I see this happen a lot with basketball players who don't wear a mouth guard or baseball players uh, who, I mean, I don't know too many baseball players that wear the, you know, wear a mouth guard, but they, they really should. Um, any, any sport, even sports that don't have what you would think to be a lot of contact, um, you're still going to need, if there's a hard ball being passed around, you probably want to, uh, to pr protect your teeth. But anyway, um, dental images are, again, very important in the evaluation of that socket and should be used to examine the region for splintered bone. You can't just jam the tooth back up in there without a radiograph. Now, um, you guys will learn about this in medical emergencies as far as what to do with that tooth, right? As far as like how to store it, how to carry it back to the dentist um, and things like that. But as far as like you being at the dentist, once the the you know, person shows up with their tooth in their hand, um, what do you do? And, and the first step is take an x-ray. Moving on, we're gonna talk about resorption. So resorption can either be external or internal, okay? Patho the, the pathologic resorption of teeth can be described as external or internal, and it depends on the location for whether it is external or internal, which I feel like is uh, pretty pretty straightforward. Okay, so resorption is broken down further into physiological resorption, physiologic, and pathologic. Okay, so physiologic, meaning the physical resorption, is what we see all the time with primary teeth. And so uh, it's, it's the process seen where the permanent tooth um, will actually resorb. The pressure of the permanent tooth erupting will cause the resorption, or like the sort of Dis, uh, dissolves of the the roots of the primary teeth. Once the root is completely uh, resorbed, then the primary crown is wiggly and it will fall out. Um, but that's not necessarily what we mean when we talk about resorption in this way. Um, so physiological resorption is what we see on radiographs when we're talking about primary teeth shedding. But pathologic resorption is typically something that is abnormal. It is a regressive alteration of that tooth structure that um, is, is observed when the tooth is subjected to an abnormal stimuli. Um, it's not always known exactly what causes the tooth to resorb. Um, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, something that they're, they're doing, um, some kind of force or trauma or inflammation or tumor or cyst or something like that. But it's not, it's not necessarily any one specific thing that will cause these, this type of, of reaction. And so um, here we're going to be talking about external and internal, which we already, which we already kind of talked about. So external resorption is typically seen along the periphery of the root surface. It's often associated with re-implanted teeth, right, if they were evolved, uh, abnormal mechanical forces, trauma, chronic inflammation, tumors and cysts, impacted teeth, or idiopathic causes, which means uh, unknown. We don't know the cause. Um, it's so when you see this on a, in an x-ray, you'll see that both the lamina dura and the bone around the blunted apex appear normal. Okay, that's, that's an important aspect because uh, it's not pathology, it's external resorption. 
Um, it's not something that you would ever see clinically. Um, and typically the tooth is still very stable inside the root. There's no mobility. Um, and there's nothing we can really do about it. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no treatment. There's no way to fix it. It's just, it happens. Um, we see this a lot actually with patients who get braces uh, as an older adult uh, because over time as we age, our uh, alveolar process does become more dense. And if we try to move our teeth through that more dense bone, the pressure will cause resorption. And so um, if we have a patient who has the tips of many of their roots are kind of, uh, of that has that resorption, they're, they're sort of blunted roots, then it's something that is uh, is a good way to ask your patient, did you have braces? Like how old were you when you had braces? Um, but if it's just one, like the image you see on 35-11, um, the other, you know, the canine looks totally normal. The, the central looks totally normal. I don't know what's going on with that lateral. And so um, um, that would have some other cause. There's some other reason for why that tooth has this resorption. Um, but anyway, the, the apical region will appear blunted and the length of the root, because the apical is blunted, will um, the length of the root will be shorter than normal. So internal resorption is cool. This is a cool one. Uh, internal resorption occurs inside the crown or the root of a tooth, and it involves the pulp chamber, the pulp canals, and the surrounding dentin. Um, now, typically, it is asymptomatic. The patient has no idea that this is happening inside their tooth. It's not painful for them. Um, it's believed to be precipitated by factors like trauma, pulp capping, and uh, pulp capping, sorry, and pulp polyps, um, but not necessarily. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, cause that. And then it appears to be a round or an ovoid translucency in the mid-crown or the mid-root portion of the tooth. Um, the treatment is, um, is endodontic therapy would be recommended if perforation has not occurred. Perforation, every time you hear this in dentistry, is going to mean that uh, it something has been perforated or the edge has, has been opened, right? So if the, the internal resorption is so big that it's kind of popped out the side of the root, uh, we'll look at this on, on an image, um, then it would, the endodontic therapy can still be effective. But if it has perforated the side of the tooth, then, um, then you're not gonna do endodontic therapy. So it really depends on the extent of the, the resorption for what would be recommended. Um, if, I'm sorry, if the, if it has been perforated, um, and it's really kind of weakened the tooth, like the tooth at any moment could break, then uh, it's, it might even be recommended that the tooth be extracted. So this top one is internal resorption that happens mid-root, right? And you could tell that if this area, this radiolucency grew any bigger, then it would perforate the side of this, this tooth, and then it, it's no longer eligible for endodontic treatment. If we caught this while, like before it perforated, which, uh, I don't even know if it's still if it's still even eligible now. I can already kind of see there's no line between the PDL space and the the uh, this darkness here. Um, and so if you catch it before it perforates, then it's eligible. It's, it's I mean it's not always 100% guarantee that it will stop the internal resorption depending on you know what's causing it. But um, but I mean hopefully it could save the tooth. And then if it once it perforates, you can see that there's there's not really that much can be done, that can be done for this tooth. Um, however, they might leave it in there. Maybe the patient isn't quite ready to get rid of it, and so they might leave it in there until it gets pretty close. And once this tooth is pretty weak, we don't want to wait until it is so weak that removing it would be difficult. So if we tried to wiggle this and take it out, like take it out, it's probably that this would break and then there'd be this root tip here. And so uh, I don't know any dentist, like any general dentist who'd go near this with like a 10 foot pole. They'd probably take one look at it and send them right over to the oral surgeon to have that removed because uh, getting a, a root tip out is, it's not always the fun, funnest thing to do. But uh, the bottom picture here shows an internal resorption that happens in the crown of the tooth, the mid crown. And you can see this very large radiolucency, right? And just in the center of the crown, looks like the pulp chamber has grown, right? Um, and so, 
this is this is internal resorption of a crown this one is you know it looks like again it's also kind of perforated the side here and uh, there's not a whole lot that can be done about this this one i mean you could do endodontic therapy maybe place some some pins and do a crown over it to try to save the tooth um but it, it really depends on the dentist and how proactive the patient wants to be okay so pulpal lesions we're moving into this next section this is on page 429 in your book um we're going to be talking about the pulp chamber and there's a couple different things that can happen in there um in, inside the pulp chamber um it's not something that you would be able to see without radiographs and so the uh the radiographs are absolutely essential for for uh, detecting these types of conditions. Um, many dental procedures require that information about the size and the location of the pulp cavity before treatment begins. So if the patient has a cavity, we need to know exactly where, you know, like we talked about, where in relation to the, uh, the cavity that the pulp is, because if it's too close, then, you know, we don't wanna fill that area. And then um, without dental images, that examination of the pulp chamber is, is not possible. The conditions we're going to talk about are pulpal sclerosis, pulpal obliteration, and pulp stones. Pulp is such a fun word to say. Pulp. So pulpal sclerosis is the first one we're going to talk about. Um, pulpal sclerosis is a diffuse calcification of the pulp chamber and pulp canals of the teeth. It results in a pulp cavity of reduced size. What this means, um, you guys will learn about the different types of dentin in uh, histo and embryo next term. Um, so the first type of dentin is like the dentin that is there when the tooth forms, to the totally normal size dentin, right? Secondary dentin is what we're talking about here, where um, all our lives, our bodies just sort of making dentin. The, the pulp chamber is just sort of laying down a new layer of dentin all the time. This is called secondary dentin. Uh, it helps because, you know, there's a little bit of wear on the outside of the tooth. So the more dentin we can lay on the inside of the tooth, the more we can help insulate our uh, tooth nerve as we age um, so that, you know, we can hopefully prevent, uh, um, you know, sensitivity, things like that. Um, then there's the third type of dentin, which is the dentin that happens when there's trauma, like the when the dentist tries to manipulate the dentin. But anyway, back secondary dentin is what we're talking about here. It is associated with aging. So as we age, we're laying down that new layer of dentin all the time. It's all always on the inside of our pulp uh, of our pulp chamber, the inside of the dentin. There's more more dentin being layered, um, and it's. A kind of of little clinical significance it really it really doesn't bother anybody it doesn't matter There's nothing wrong with it um, unless they have to have a root canal and then and then you know having a, a tiny 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 little uh, nerve chamber is is kind of important for the endodontist um, but anyway uh, you can see this on figure 35-14 that is on page 430 in your book and you can see that the pulp chamber is just kind of smaller than it normally is. Um, some of the conditions that can affect this would be attrition, abrasion, caries, dental restorations, trauma, and abnormal forces. So any type of force that is just not the intended, um, you know, mastication kind of force will cause a pulpal irritation and that will stimulate the production of secondary dentin that results in the obliteration of the pulp cavity obliteration is also i think it's just a cool word so pulpal obliteration is the calcification or uh, uh de deposition goodness of hard tissue within the pulp cavity this is the production of that secondary dentin that obliterates which means it closes off completely the pulp chamber these teeth are no longer vital they're no longer getting blood to them and what's nice is they kind of did their own root canal on themselves and so they don't require treatment they're they're not sensitive they don't hurt um and and there's nothing really wrong with them um, it can be caused by attrition uh, abrasion attrition being like that wearing down right when people grind their teeth they cause attrition abrasion being when they uh, some mechanical force like toothbrush abrasion uh, caries dental restorations can often cause it trauma uh, or abnormal mechanical forces the tooth doesn't have a pulp chamber anymore 
and the pulp, the pulp canal is gone. So you can see this on figure 35-15 and 35-16. There's just um there's just no more no more canal there. It's kind of cool. So up next is pulp stones. Um, a pulp stone is a uh, dystrophic calcification which is found in the pulp chamber or in the pulp canals. They appear on dental images as round, ovoid, or cylindrical radiopacities. They can vary in size and shape and number. Uh, they don't cause symptoms. They don't require treatment. There's nothing wrong with them. There's just a little kind of calcification sitting inside the, inside the nerve, and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so on a dental image, the pulp stones appear round, ovoid, or even cylindrical. Okay, um, this image is not in your book. It's um, it's an outside image, and so uh, it's it's like really close up to that tooth. Uh, I specifically remember seeing a pulp stone question on my on my board. Although of course that doesn't necessarily mean you'll see one on yours. Uh, but understanding what a pulp stone is, because it'll be it'll be very rare that you'll see something like this. And so um, you know a pulp stone, a salivary stone, a um, you know, kidney stones, they're all actually kind of made of the same stuff. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so next up are periapical lesions and how we see them on the radiographs. So there are periapical radiolucencies and there are periapical radiopacities, right? Radiolucencies being dark, radiopacities being uh, light or white. Um, a periapical, examples of a periapical radiolucency would be a, a periapical granuloma, a periapical cyst, periapical abscess, or a periodontal abscess, right? Two totally different things there. Then for radiopacities, we have condensing osteitis, sclerotic bone and hypersemantosis uh, and we're going to talk about each of these but just so we know the word periapical it means around the tip of the root of a tooth so periapical granulomas cysts and abscesses are pretty common they're they're commonly seen on dental images you're gonna you're gonna see a few of these um, these lesions cannot be diagnosed on their dental image appearance alone now Will there be dentists who look at them and say, you know, this is the treatment that we need? Yes, but do they know 100% for sure whether it's a granuloma, a cyst, or just an abscess? Not necessarily. Um, the diagnosis uh, is based on the clinical features and the dental image and sometimes a microscopic appearance. So if we were to uh, look at our periapical lesion and then there is very clearly a, um, a cavity or a caries that does extend all the way to the um, pulp chamber, then it is most likely a periapical abscess. Um, but if there's no cavity and there is a, a periapical radiolucency, then you know it could more likely be a cyst or granuloma. And so, without that microscopic appear, without that microscopic examination, we would be unable to definitively diagnose it. So a periapical granuloma is a localized mass of chronically inflamed granulation tissue at the apex of a non-vital tooth. Okay, the tooth has died. It is the most common squala of pulpitis. Uh, it gives rise to a cyst or to an abscess. The treatment is typically either endodontics or removing the tooth uh, with curatage of the apical region. This is important. Um, there have been, I, I'm sure some of you have um, assisted in um, the extraction of teeth where the dentist is kind of digging around inside the socket a little bit, and that is them um, curataging or cutting away at that apical region in order to remove all of that granulated tissue. Um, on a dental image, it will appear as a widened periodontal ligament space at the root apex. Um, so typically a granuloma will result from a pulpal death or necrosis and or the inflammation of that pulp. Typically, it's asymptomatic, but it does have a history of prolonged sensitive to heat and cold. And so uh, it's not something that's going to give the patient a lot of tooth pain. Um, the lamina dura 
will not be visible between the root apex and the apical legion. So it's not going to have that cortical bone that, uh, you know, we talked about in uh, last week, the corticated bone around the tip of the root. We're not going to have that, okay? And then in order to see this, you can refer to figures 35-20 and 35-21. A periapical cyst is a lesion that develops over a long period. It will result from a cystic degeneration of the periapical granuloma. So if you have a granuloma and it just sort of hangs out in there, then over time it can cause a periapical cyst. It is the most common of all tooth-related cysts. Um, it's typically asymptomatic, it won't hurt, and treatment is either endodontic therapy or extraction with curatage of the apical region same as the periapical granuloma. Um, sometimes it's also known as a radicular cyst, right? Radicular meaning root, um, but not interradicular, right? Don't get those confused. And then uh, it will result from that pulpal death or that necrosis. Um, sometimes it can make up 50 to 70% of all the cysts that are in the oral uh, region. So it's a pretty, it's, you know, it's the most common one. Um, It'll appear round or ovoid. And then you can see here in this image, it will have that cortical bone. Uh, so it will be corticated. So a periapical abscess. This is a localized collection of pus around the apex of a non-vital tooth. Now, if it is acute, right? That means it's, it's short term. It's just happened. It will be painful. Whew, it'll be painful. It'll be non-vital right? So the tooth is dead. And it's going to be very, very sensitive to pressure, percussion, and heat. Um, it, it may not or always, but it, it sometimes it will, but it might not always appear on a dental image, okay? It just depends on how much of the bone it um, resorbs as the, as the abscess grows. Now, if it's a chronic inf uh, inflammation, if it's a chronic uh, condition, it could be asymptomatic, which means that the pus, this is, uh, it's going to drain through the bone, that little burrow of bone that it, it drains through is called a fistula, and, um, or it could drain out the periodontal ligament space. Sometimes you're going to place your, your probe or, you know, and it's like the first thing you put in there is usually the probe. And so you stick the probe in there and then pus comes out with you. Um, that's, uh, that's a good indication that there's a big O infection right there. Um, it's going to appear on a radiograph as a round or ovoid apical radiolucency. Um, it always results from that pulpal death. There's always some type of infection happening there. Uh, so this one is the one that's really associated with that tooth pain. Um, you're going to find this in your book on figure 35-24 and 35-25. Next up is the periodontal abscess, different from a periapical abscess, okay? The collection of pus that results from an infection within the periodontal tissue, the surrounding of the tooth, okay? That's important. This is a key difference. Um, so the difference between a periapical abscess and a periodontal abscess is that the periapical abscess is the collection of pus that results from a necrotic pulp which is inside the tooth, okay? A periodontal abscess is a collection of pus that results from an infection within the periodontal tissues, the area that surrounds the tooth. So periapical, inside. Periodontal, around the side, okay? It's on the outside or around the side, surrounding the tooth, anyway. Um, so a periodontal abscess will be uh, will have acute destructive process. It's going to create a big abscess quickly. Um, it occurs as a complication of advanced periodontal disease. This is the reason why we do not let you start a quadrant before you are able to finish that quadrant. Uh, if you don't have enough time, you're not allowed to get started. This is why it is such a bad idea for a dental hygienist to do a profi or a, a regular cleaning on a patient who needs a deep cleaning, who has um, subgingival calculus. Because if you were to remove enough calculus toward the, uh, like at the top of where the tissue attaches and you get that reattachment, you will sort of seal in the calculus on the side of the tooth that is more subgingival and it will um, like here. Okay, so here's the tooth. And then here's the root, right? 
So then well, I guess it probably wouldn't have this many, but anyway. Um, so if let's say the calculus is here on the side and it's also down here on this side, right? And then here is the tissue. Well, then you remove this calculus, but you leave this calculus on bottom down here. This tissue is going to reattach to this tooth and it's going to happen around this area. And it's going to reattach, right? But that means that this calculus down here, this piece of bacteria is now just going to fester. It's going to grow and it's, I mean, it, it has to grow, but it no longer has an outlet. It's no longer going to come out the top. It's now just going to press the tissue around it away. And so that is a periodontal or around the tooth abscess. Um, it will appear on your radiograph as a radiolucent area because it is resorbing the alveolar bone around it um, along the lateral aspect of the root. It, the most common symptom is a deep throbbing pain. It's the pain of the bone around the tooth as it has that pressure, which is causing resorption. Um, the therapy will include drainage, subgingival scaling, and debridement of periodontal tissues. So the, the treatment is the cleaning that they should have gotten in the first place, that they refused or that you didn't have enough time for, and then you finally have enough time to go back and clean it. Only now they are missing a lot more bone than they would have. You can see this on figure 35-26. All right, next up is periapical radiopacities, or white or light areas. These are not as common as periapical radiolucencies, uh, but they, they do happen. Um, the most common ones that we'll see will be condensing osteitis, sclerotic bone, and hypersementosis. Um, any one of these radiopacities are found near a root, I'm sorry, near a tooth apex, um, can be diagnosed based on characteristic dental image findings and corroborating clinical information. Uh, so you ask your patient some questions, you get a, a good clinical examination, the radiograph appearance and the patient history should be able to give us a good idea of which one of these um, conditions that your patient has. So first up is condensing osteitis is a well-defined radiopacity, right? Unilocular or uh, multi, I'm sorry, the, the uh, focal opacity, right? Um, it's seen below the apex of a tooth with a history of long-standing pulpitis. So the patient has had a pulp issue around the tip of the root for a long time, okay? That's something that we need to keep in mind. It can vary in shape and size and does not appear to be attached to the tooth root, right? I can still see a PDL space right around the tip of the root here. There's a PDL all the way around. So the PDL space tells me that this osteitis is not a part of the tooth. Um, it is the most common periapical radiopacity observed in adults, and it's most common around the mandibular third molar. Um, it's also known as a chronic focal sclerosing osteomyelitis, although I'm not going to quiz you on that one, okay? Um, the opacity represents a proliferation of periapical bone that is a result of a low-grade or mild irritation. Basically, there has been a lot of issues with this area in the past, and so your body fills in that space with new bone um, because it's it, somehow it uh, you know the area triggers the bone to to start building there, and it does. Um, there's no treatment that's necessary. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, and then to see this in your book, you'll look at Figure 35-27. Sclerotic bone is anytime there's a well-defined radiopacity that is seen below the apices of non-vital, I'm sorry, of vital non-carious teeth. Um, there's no known cause. We don't aren't sure why they form. It's not attached to a tooth. It's not even touching a tooth. Okay. It varies in size and shape. The margins can be smooth or irregular or diffuse. So uh, anything, they can be anything. <laughs> and then it's asymptomatic. It's not painful for your patients. Um, sometimes it's also known as osteosclerosis or idiopathic periapical osteosclerosis. Not going to quiz you on that. Um, it's usually discovered when you take a routine image because, you know, there's no, there's no problems there. Um, you can see this in your book on figure 35-28. Okay, last up is hypersementosis. So oh, hypersementosis is the excess deposition of cementum. Cementosis, 
cementum on root surfaces. It can result from super eruption, inflammation, or trauma. Super eruption is when there's no opposing tooth, and so the tooth that is growing in just keeps on growing, right? There's nothing to stop it. Um, most often, it will affect the apical area, which will appear enlarged and bulbous. Okay, it looks like this. I've actually uh, recorded this slide a couple times now, but I, I keep drawing on this and then it looks inappropriate. So I'm just not gonna, I'm just gonna draw this one section now. Uh, the affected teeth are still vital. The tooth is still alive and it does not require treatment. This image isn't the best, but if you look on figure 35-29, um, that is an example of hypercementosis around a maxillary premolar. You can see how the uh, the cementum is just kind of thicker on that one and it, it does look pretty bulbous. Um, but the main aspect here, you can tell the difference between this and a tooth that has uh, been ankylosed or um, um, where the, the PDL space is gone is that there's still a PDL space here. So uh, in your book, it's, it's really easy to tell that there is still a PDL space and there is still a cortical bone or that uh, the lamina dura is still there. Um, but when you, know, you have ankylosis, which you're probably learning about in a different class, which we don't typically diagnose from radiographs, um, there is no longer a PDL space. All right. So, uh, that's the end of this. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure of mine, talking to you about all of these different chapters. Um, kudos to you, you made it to the end of the material. That's, uh, that's pretty big. Um, I don't know if I've ever fully gone through a full textbook before. Most of the time uh, in classes, you kind of get the highlights. Uh, there was only one chapter in this book that we actually didn't, didn't talk about, we didn't read. And so, um, well, I mean, half of you did read it because you still sent me your quizzes, quizzes on it. So um, I'm not really sure about that. But um, anyway, th this has been a lot of fun. Um, if you have questions about chapter 35 or you have questions about any chapter in this book, please, uh, please ask them. Next week, we're going to be doing a live session for review for the final. And uh, so if you've gotten this far in the in the lecture, then uh, I encourage you to come to that because there will be a lot of information there. Um, although it is not mandatory, if you're busy or you can't make it, you'll you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, if you have questions about 35 or anything else, you just uh, just let me know. You can ask me in, in lab or or you can send me an email or, uh, you know, we didn't really use the question and answer discussion board. I really thought that was going to be a thing, but it didn't. All right. And here are uh, once again the APA six um, references from the chapter. <laughs>